We told you you could ask us anything, and you did. So let's get to it. First off, thank you to everybody who submitted a question. This was a lot of fun for us, and we haven't done this format of video before. So as you watch it, if you find this helpful, please leave a comment and let us know, and we will do more of this in the future. All right, let's move on to the first question. Hi, my name is Elma Khan. I'm from Kazakhstan. So the motion design, the motion uh, animation, like in general, are not popular here in, here in Kazakhstan. And uh, uh, what steps should we take to become a motion designer? Because here you can't just go and uh, be motion designer, work like that. Uh, what pieces of advice would you give, would you recommend to become one? So, and uh, briefly, thank you very much for doing all the content. I've been watching you guys for quite a long time. And yeah, I'm really grateful to you guys for doing that. Hey, Yermahan, thanks so much for asking about how to start your career in motion design. This can indeed be challenging if you live in a place where there isn't already an established community, but I'll give you a few pieces of advice that should help you get started no matter where you are. The first is to commit to learning how to make the kind of work you like and want to get paid for. There are actually a lot of options about which apps you can use these days. The industry standards are Cinema 4D and After Effects, and School of Motion has awesome courses for learning those. But there are alternatives like Rive, Fable, Spline, and Blender that can be great solutions depending on your budget and the hardware you have. For learning these, you can use free tutorials, you can use formal courses, you can even use physical books. Choose what works for you, commit to learning it, and start making some cool stuff that you're passionate about. Making work and sharing it is a great way to start networking with other motion designers. If you don't live somewhere with studios or meetups, you can take advantage of online resources. School of Motion has an alumni group where our students can interact and network, but there are plenty of other Reddits, Slacks, and Discords filled with helpful folks from all over the world. So if there's nothing near you, you can still network, you just have to do it online. You may find folks in very similar situations who could mentor you and give you specific advice about how they've been able to get clients both internationally and locally. You can also find folks to answer your questions, collaborate with, and give you feedback on your portfolio, which you'll want for this next part. You might actually have more local clients than you think. Any company that needs digital advertising or design work may also need motion, they just don't know it yet. So you could teach them about what motion design could do for their brand, and you get to position yourself as the expert. I hope some of these ideas were helpful for you, and we at School of Motion wish you the best of luck and hope that you have a fabulous career in motion design. My name is Ray Sam, and my question is, is it possible to defeat the necessary evil of social media? I get that it's the main way to discover and be discovered as an artist today, but the more reports that reveal the ethics and side effects of being on these apps all day, the less I wanna subject myself to the psychic damage to use a Dungeons and Dragons term. Uh, are there any other platforms or spaces that would be better to cultivate a network of new artists and also get leads on new clients for work for the social media adverse out there? Hey, what's up, Ray Sam? Awesome question. Thank you so much. So here's the way I look at it. First of all, yes, I agree with you. Social media is, you know, sort of a parasite on society to some extent. And as artists, it can really be this love hate relationship because, yes, it can be a way of getting inbound client leads. You can have a nice, you know, online persona that attracts the kind of clients you want and then they reach out to you and you get work. That is one way of getting work. But I've always told artists that I think even today, the best way to get work is to have a different approach, an outbound approach, where you actually identify clients you wanna work with, you go after them, you reach out to them and let them know you exist and that you're an artist and give them an opportunity to look at your work. I think it's much more scalable, it's much more repeatable, it's much more efficient to do it that way. So make sure that you've got the basics down. Make sure you have a nice, you know, custom URL that makes you look professional. Make sure your email address isn't raysam132 at gmail.com. Make sure your portfolio site is set up correctly. You've got a nice grid of images or GIFs that take you into individual projects. And I would recommend having some case studies in there. Make sure you have a nice about page. And go on LinkedIn, find 100 companies you'd like to work with. 
do some homework and try to find out who at that company might be the person hiring. Find their email address. You use a tool like Hunter.io or Rocket Reach and then email them and just let them know that you're a motion designer out there and that you're a fan of their work. And by doing that over and over again, you are gonna get people who will, you know, click the link in your email that has your portfolio in it. They're gonna check you out. And if your work is good and it's appropriate for what they're doing, they're gonna book you sooner or later. So doing that is much better in my opinion than waiting for social media to feed you clients. And if you're doing that, frankly, you don't need social media. Hello, uh, my name is Celia and my question is in Cinema 4D, what is the proper way of uh, only looping a selection of keyframes. Say if I have 10 keyframes and I only want to loop the last uh, four of them, uh, what is the proper way of doing that? Thank you. Hi Celia, I'm happy to answer your question on how to only loop specific frames from an animation. I have these booths on this table and some french fries and ketchup and mustard that are being animated so that they start floating like they're in outer space or something like that. So the french fries stop moving and I want them to continuously loop at the end in space. But in order to do that, I can only loop a few keyframes of the linear field that I'm using in order to animate them. You'll see that if I move this up and down the linear field, that's how I'm animating that section. And the part that I'd like to loop is from frame 150 and forward. So only these three keyframes here. In order to do that, I will go up to the animate dropdown menu and select add motion clip with the linear field selected. I'll make sure that I include what I'd like to be recorded. So I have position, rotation. I really only need position, but I'm going to leave these other ones selected and hit OK. And then it will open up the motion mode instead of the F curve mode. You can switch back and forth here. And in motion mode, you'll see your motion clip we just created. In order to make this loopable but only part of it we'll need to cut this clip so i will right click on this clip and go down to cut and i'll cut right here where i'd like it to loop and then i'll switch modes by right clicking again and with this one selected the part that i'd like to loop you'll see in our attributes manager we have a loop option and this loop option i can choose how many times this will loop and let's say I want it to loop six times, I can go ahead and do that. And if I hit play, you'll see that the animation continues on and continues looping for as many times that it's, I'd like. So this is the part of the video where I have to ask you to like and subscribe to our channel. I know it's annoying, but it really does help us if you subscribe to the channel. First of all, you get to know the second that we drop new videos, but also it really helps us make more video content. So if this is helpful, if you like the kind of content we've been putting out lately, please consider just gently, ever so gently, tapping that subscribe button. Thank you. Let's get back to the questions. Hi, my name is Jack Hale, and I would like to ask, with AI becoming more used in everyday workflows and NVIDIA's huge announcements the other week, where do you see the future of 3D freelancing? All right, so we have Jack Hale asking, how will AI affect 3D freelancing? And of course, AI is a very loaded topic these days, and I think we need to remember and have perspective that AI is literally going to disrupt every single industry, not just our own. So we're, we're not alone in that respect, but how you react to change is a totally conscious decision that you and you alone make, because let's be real, uh, you can't control the fact that AI is just going to continue to disrupt everything, but you can control how you react to that, right? And you can either be afraid of it and totally avoid it completely and constantly be stressing out about it, which is not productive at all or you can embrace it and learn how to use it to your advantage and make your job easier. So for a 3D freelancer, for example, let's say a studio wants to hire you for a Nike ad. What's the first thing you do? You go to Pinterest and you try to create a mood board based on existing work that uh, already exists, right? Well, now you can use AI to generate your own custom mood boards that by the way is made up of work that has never 
been existing before. Like no other eyes have seen it because you made a unique image with whatever prompt that you fed uh, that AI. So now you got some mood boards, but do you know how to model and texture a Nike shoe from scratch? No? Well, with text to 3D, which is literally something that just uh, kind of came out last week. Meta is, is doing something with it as well. Um, you can basically just generate 3D models from words. Yeah. So no more endlessly searching Turbo Squid for uh, the precise model you need and worrying about the quality of it. And do you need bespoke textures for that Nike shoe? Well, you can also create bespoke textures uh, using AI as well. And mind you, all these AI tools are not quite there yet. Like they're not gonna generate a very clean mesh or anything like that uh, right now. But as fast as this stuff is advancing, like it's only a matter of time before you have very nice uh, topologized 3D models that uh, you can generate again using text. So uh, as a 3D generalist, to be able to generate whatever model or texture you want is, is pretty huge because now you can spend whatever time that you are gonna spend learning how to model or learning how to you know, generate custom textures and you can spend that time more on, say, things that you have uh, weaknesses in, like design fundamentals, lighting, uh, storytelling, developing your own unique style, voice and vision. The, the things that actually AI would have a hard time replicating, all of those skills that will make you stand out, those are things that you will now have more time to be able to hone in on and develop because of the time that using AI will save you. So coming back to the original question, how will AI affect 3D freelancing? Well, if you embrace it, it's gonna make your job even easier. Thanks so much for the question, Jack. Hi, my name is Franco, and my question is, how can I get more people to commission me for freelance work, even though I'm not popular in the freelance industry? Um, I have worked with people in the past, but I would like to make my work more constant than it is because right now I get little to no freelance work. So how can I approach new people to work for them? Thank you. Hey, Franco, this is an awesome question. Now, I already answered something similar for Ray Sam, so I'm gonna answer yours a little bit differently. If you're doing all of the basics, if you have your portfolio set up and it's professional and you have a good about page and all of the basics, I talk about this in the Freelance Manifesto. You know, basically, if you're not getting the basics right, start there. Once you're doing that, then you have to be a good freelancer. You have to be the kind of freelancer that clients book once and then they can't live without that freelancer. So that means when they book you, focus on being the best communicator they've ever worked with. Over communicate everything. And then, and here's a big one, make sure that you're letting them know occasionally that you're available. Don't assume that the producer you worked with six months ago remembers how great you were to work with. In that time, they may have done 20 other projects. And so even though if they saw you on the street, they'd say hi and remember you, you're not at the top of their mind. So I say every three months, every client you've ever worked with, just shoot them a quick email saying, hey, just wanted to say hi, I had a blast working on that last project. By the way, I have some availability next month if you need any help, hope you're doing well. That's it, an availability check email will go a long way and you'd be shocked at how often those emails turn into, oh yeah, wow, we actually do have a job coming up in the next two weeks. I'm glad you reached out because we do need an animator, right? So I would say that's probably something that you could focus on is following up with clients that you've already worked with. But if you're not doing the basics, listen to Ray Sam's answer and follow that first. Hi, my name is Dagmar and my question is, how is the motion design industry changing to be more inclusive to women, minorities, and people that have not been very represented in the industry thus far. Hi Dagmar, thanks so much for asking about diversity and motion design. I started in motion design 20 years ago and at that time it was not very diverse at all. I was the only female on the team. The team was entirely um, made up of white people. I think we've gotten to a much better place now where we see people of all genders, all gender identities, and all shapes, colors, and sizes in motion design. We do still have work to do and there are a couple things that we are doing at School of Motion to help that happen. As motion design becomes more widely known, we want it to also become more accessible to more people. We offer a scholarship program, which um, is intended to help people who either live in countries where the currency isn't great to be able to afford our courses or people who for whatever reason just would not be able to afford the course. That program is intended to help bring more diversity to motion design. Uh, we've partnered with a group called Panama 
Panimation in the past, which is one of my favorite motion design organizations. Panimation is focused on bringing women and non-binary people into the motion design field and offering opportunities for them. And so that is another great avenue through which we are all trying to make motion design a more diverse industry. I'm gonna briefly interject here to tell you about our free 10-day intro to motion design class. The Path to MoGraph. This class is jam-packed with content. You'll get to see what it's like inside of some of the best studios in the industry, what it's like to take a motion design project from start to finish, including some of the tools and techniques that are most commonly used, and you'll get a really good idea of what it's like to do this professionally. So if you're curious about motion design, if you wanna go a little bit deeper, check out our free course, The Path to MoGraph, link in the description. Hi, School of Motion. My name is Cody, this is Millie, and our question is, what is next for School of Motion? Do you guys have more courses that you're developing? More workshops? Are you going to take over the world? What is coming up? Hi there, guys. My name is David, and I just want to know one thing. Are you guys going to be bringing out any new courses in the near future? The courses I've taken at School of Motion, they're absolutely game changing and it would be great if we can have some new courses, maybe even small courses uh, where you dive into a subject like 3D modeling or substance painter or, some, or ZBrush or something like that. It would be really great if you guys can work on something like that. Big thanks to David, Cody, and especially Millie for the kind words and great questions. Trust me when I say that the folks on the School of Motion team are just as hyped about making new content as you are about learning from it. In case you missed it, earlier this year, we added MoGraph Mentor to the School of Motion family. Over there, you'll find several short instant access courses on 2D and 3D animation, design, directing, and other topics. So if you want something today, that's not a bad place to start. I will say that we've been hard at work over here making some new stuff and you won't have to wait long for some of it. New courses, new topics, and different formats are definitely good ideas, and we think so too. There are a lot of factors that go into what courses we choose to create and when we choose to create them. We get awesome suggestions all the time, thank you, and we have a list here with probably 100 solid ideas on it. But we're always on the lookout for good topics and potential instructors, so please feel free to tell us anytime what you wanna learn and who you wanna learn it from. We also get asked about offering different formats for some of our existing courses, so that might be something we've been exploring as well. So, more courses, more workshops, take over the world? I can confidently say yes to at least some of those. Hi, my name's Walter. My question is, working in Cinema 4D, what would be the best approach in learning how to use the camera and doing better light setups? Hi, Walter. Something that might help you improve your lighting and camera work inside of Cinema 4D, besides taking our Cinema 4D classes, is to learn about lighting in real life. Learn about how different photographers set up their lighting. There's all different kinds of setups for photography. You can learn about it online. You can take out some books on photography at the library. Something else you can do to improve your lighting is by watching some of your favorite films. See how they do lighting within the films and think about how you could replicate that within Cinema 4D. See what kinds of camera movements they use and how they transition with those camera movements. Notice how the camera movements align with different characters within the story. And you can try to learn from that as well. Those are some great places to learn more about lighting and camera work. Another really wonderful place to learn about lighting is actually by just visiting a museum. You can learn so much just by observing paintings and seeing what other artists have done throughout history. One historical period that I find really interesting for art is Impressionism, because artists studied how different weather and times of day affected the lighting outside and how it affected different colors. And they spent time studying that and painting it and learning from it. And something that I think you can learn from that historical period is that you can learn lighting just from observing the world around you as well. You can go outside and see what kinds of shadows there are at different times of day, see how the color of the light changes in different weather, and there's so much that can be learned from that. Hey, Joey, uh, my name is Stephen Jenkins, and uh, my question is, during this upcoming recession or downturn, I was wondering how you think it will affect 
uh, the motion graphics industry? Do you think it'll slow down or stay the same? Or appreciate your insights. Thanks. Hey, Steven. All right. Very tough question. I know a lot of artists are concerned about this right now. So I look back to 2008, which was the last time there was a big economic downturn while I was working. And so what happened then? I was freelance. I was worried that all of my freelance clients would go away and I'd never make another dollar. And actually the opposite happened. So here's why. First of all, advertising budgets did shrink during that time. They eventually go back up but they did shrink for a while. And the type of advertising that clients wanted shifted too. They were shifting a little bit more towards measurable advertising as opposed to unmeasurable advertising like TV commercials, which are much harder to, to gauge the effectiveness of. And so there was a lot more work for motion designers to do, but because of the downturn, a lot of agencies and studios had to shrink their staffs. And so who's left to do the work? Well, it's freelancers. So in an economic downturn like this, there's actually a ton of opportunity for freelancers that are good at sending outbound emails and introducing themselves to people and have a nice portfolio and have a nice about page. It's actually, I think, gonna be easier than ever to get your foot in the door at certain companies that may have, may have had a big staff before and it'd be hard to actually get them to book you. Now, if you are full-time, I would just make sure that you have your portfolio and your reel and your network as dialed in as you can. I know it's not always easy when you have a full-time job to keep up with those things, but now is a really good time to do it just in case. Even if you love your job and you want to stay there until you retire, I would say it never hurts to have a personal brand, a personal portfolio, have a network. You can do this on the internet pretty easily. There's a ton of Slack channels and Discord channels and Twitter and a lot of ways to build a network, even if you're not in a medium or large size market. And if you are, you should be going to meetups, you know, once, twice a year just to meet people in person. If you have all of that in place and you do get laid off, it's going to be much, much easier to land your next gig because you'll be ready and you will stand out head and shoulders above the artists that don't have that stuff ready and are, you know, trying to send password protected Vimeo links and stuff like that. So there's no easy answer to this, but I would say the best thing you can do is just be prepared in any case. And if you are freelance, I would actually look at this as an opportunity and don't be afraid of reaching out to clients who you've never worked with before. I wanna say thank you to everybody who submitted a question. This was a lot of fun and I hope we get to do it again in the future. If you found this useful, leave a comment and let us know and that way we'll know if this is something that we should do again. And if you'd like to ask a question, the easiest thing to do is just get on our mailing list and we will tell you every time we do something like this. Go to schoolemotion.com, go click register in the top right corner and enter your email address and then you'll be notified every single time we do anything cool like this. And next time, maybe it will be your question that we get to answer. So that's it for this video. Thank you so much. Have an awesome day.